A very good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the ISAS panel discussion titled India Budget Fis Fiscal Year Prospects and Challenges. The panel discussion will analyze the various details of the recently presented India budget and lend insights on the impact and effectiveness of the policies in addressing their objectives. To commence the session, we would like to at first invite Associate Professor Iqbal Singh Savia, Director, Institute of South Asia Studies, NUS, to deliver the welcome remarks. Dr. Savia, please. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore, I welcome you to this afternoon's session entitled India Budget Financial Year 2025, Prospects and Challenges. So thank you for joining us today. As all of you who are here know, on Tuesday, the Finance Minister of India, Nirmala Sitaraman, presented the budget. Now, in any normal year, the presentation of a budget of India, a country with 1.4 billion people, fifth largest economy, racing to become the third largest economy, in any given year, this would be a very interesting and important budget in itself. But this budget also is responding to a specific context. If we look domestically, and I, I won't try and preempt anything the speakers are going to say, but I'll just point this out that the, the domestically, there was a very important thing that happened just before this. The elections took place. And in these elections, while the BJP emerged as the largest party, it did not have a majority. So it has to govern in a coalition. This raises a very important question about how should we approach this budget in itself? Is it a BJP budget? Is it a coalition budget? Uh, to be sure, those who have been following the budget, we know that certain concessions and, and offers have been made to, to seal up the alliances, etc. Bihar and Andhra Pradesh have got a fair share of, uh, of, of deals in this budget, and I, I'm sure we'll be speaking about this. But I guess the other more important issue perhaps that we want to address today it's actually what other issues came out of these elections that uh, the government is trying to handle with. And one of these is the issue of jobs. Now, if you listen to uh, uh, the finance minister's speech, you will you will have realized that, and I, I may be mistaken, but I think she mentioned the, thing, the term jobs 33 times, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. And this is because the evaluation is that the BJP did not receive the majority that they were hoping to receive, primarily because of the issue of unemployment. So I think we need to pay attention to how and how this budget aims to tackle the issue of unemployment, but not just unemployment, but also the issues of underemployment, and also the key issue of skilling and reskilling the workforce, because with a very young population, India's demographics could be a dividend, but it could also be a problem for India if they're not able to skill this workforce for the job market. This budget has made some sounds in that regard, and I think this is one thing that we'll be talking about. The other thing is that we also need to know there is, a, there is a greater international context to this as well. Now, we all know that the geopolitical and geoeconomic scenario is in flux. Um, India is trying to position itself to benefit from the diversification of supply chains. It's trying to benefit from the China plus one strategy. But at the same time, India is very aware that it needs to build on its manufacturing base as well. And these are some of the issues that have been raised in this budget have been raised in previous budgets as well. And I think one of the questions that we should be grappling with today is how is India positioning itself to build on this manufacturing, uh, to expand on this manufacturing sector. Some of the things that we spoke about after the last uh, budget, be it the um, incentive scheme, are not really being spoken about as much this time around. What's the new approach? Now, I don't want to say any more except to highlight that we have four eminent speakers today. Uh, who will be talking about what the budget has promised, what policy directions the budget is pointing towards, which sectors stand to benefit, but also I hope we'll be grappling with what else perhaps could have been focused upon that's not been dealt with as well. So with that, I like to hand over the floor to um, to the my, uh, Dr. Amit and Dupalit and my fellow panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Iqbal, and uh, welcome everybody to this uh, discussion that we are having on the India budget fiscal year 2025, the prospects and challenges. So what we thought we would do before uh, actually uh, bringing you into the discussion is to quickly run through a presentation that we have prepared uh, from ISAS on the highlights of the budget. And this is a presentation uh, that's been prepared by 
my colleague Divya Murali with uh, inputs from me as well. So uh, let's just take a look at uh, how this is doing. Okay. Uh, as is customary, the budget uh, is preceded by a pre-budget economic survey, which is presented on the table of the parliament uh, the day before the budget is done. Now, the economic survey gives a reflection of the overall state of the economy, the various priority areas, but it's a, it's an analysis of the way the year has been. It's not getting into any future forecasting. Uh, by and large, what the sentiment uh, was around the budget and even before it was predicted was that the Indian economy was in a fairly sweet spot in so far as its overall uh, GDP and growth performance was concerned. The financial year 2024 ended with the economy registering a growth of 8.2% in real terms. Now, if you look at this growth of 8.2%, add to it the fact that there was an inflation of 5% for the year, the economy actually ends up with a nominal growth of 13% plus, which is uh, by any global standards, a fairly impressive number. Once this is absorbed, uh, there's also this understanding, and this again is what the economic survey put out, that we do have a bit of a sobering as far as the current year is concerned. Uh, financial year 2025 is not going to yield as much growth as the previous uh, belief because there's clearly a bottoming out that that kind of a growth rate cannot be maintained. Uh, what was important for the budget was to also look at whether the fiscal consolidation was being continued. So in the last budget that was presented, the fiscal deficit was projected at 5.6%. And this time it's been projected to come down to 4.9%. That's a fairly in impressive cut if it could be achieved. There's concern over inflation, uh, significant concern over inflation. I just uh, took that 5% number on an average benchmark stick, but... Uh, inflation and its maintenance in a downward trajectory will obviously be a major <laughs> challenge. And I think the budget is working on the assumption that there will be a 4% um, sort of converging around the inflation number. But there's one number that I thought it will be good to bring up over here with the uh, group as we go ahead, since Iqbal also alluded to the international context. If you look at this particular table, this table actually is, is a table which... Uh, looks at how the major economies of the world have been able to return to their pre-pandemic growth levels. So what we have over here is how the pre-pandemic growth level was 2019 vis-a-vis -vis what the performances of these economies have been in 2023. So we are looking at 2023 as a proportion of what these economies were in 2019 in terms of the growth rate that they've achieved. Two countries stand out here. One is, of course, uh, no surprise in that, that's China, which has a number of 120, which basically shows that its rate of economy is 120% higher in terms of growth rate that was achieved pre-pandemic. And the other one is India. So the Pre-pandemic recovery, at least in 2023, was the highest for China and India in terms of the rebounds that they have experienced. And if one looks at other emerging market economies, most of them have been pretty low. If one looks at, let's say, for example, South Africa, Thailand, uh, Japan, Italy, the G7 ones, pretty low. So again, I mean, the salience of this China economy relationship in so far as the context of the world economy is concerned becomes pretty obvious. Uh, this is always a, a sort of a, you know, very close ball, live ball, hard ball kind of a chart to take at. But uh, if we take a look at the way uh, this is coming in, so the budget, all this is in uh, sort of trillion numbers, but it's just to show you where all the numbers are coming from. Uh, this is the revenue side. This is the expenditure side. Uh, most of the expenditure on the budget is going to go to allotted schemes, which are already running. So that's the scheme expenditure, uh, out of which a significant part of the central sector schemes, the schemes that are run by the central government, including the Prime Minister's National Rural Employment Guarantee Program, the food support programs, uh, there are uh, rural housing programs. All these schemes are administered by the central government. And there are also schemes which 
are run by the state governments with support from the central government. So there's a significant part which is going to go there. Uh, transfers, establishment, and other expenditure. Now, much as we try to overlook this component, this component is difficult to be overlooked because this essentially shows the costs that the government is making in maintaining itself. It's clearly the revenue expenditure part of it. This is not going to create any kind of future capital assets or anything, but this is just the cost of maintaining itself. Uh, while this has come down over the years, it continues to remain substantive. And if we look at the other side on this side now, uh, uh, there's some expectation that uh, we will have as much contribution from the GST and the taxes on income, as well as the corporate tax, to go into the gross tax revenues. There is uh, less expectation, I would gather, this year. This is something that we can discuss when it comes to the non-tax revenue. The non-tax revenue is essentially what the government gets by disinvesting its sales uh, positions in government assets, uh, public sector enterprises, which really hasn't been a very hot item insofar as successful reflection in the budget is concerned. There were four major themes. Now, whether this has got anything to do with the political context that Iqbal mentioned uh, in, in his opening remarks is something that we can discuss. So four important elements were put out by the finance minister in her budget. Employment, skilling, MSMEs is medium, small, and micro enterprises, and the middle class. These are four that are supposed to be the thrust areas of the budget's emphasis. Uh, right at the bottom, there is this uh, catchphrase, which is called the Vixit Bharat 2047. Vixit Bharat, in short, refers to the target 2047 as the year by which India is expected to become a developed economy. And in that scheme of moving towards a developing uh, developed economy, before that, there are other targets to be achieved. One of the most proximate targets is by 2028 or by the end of the current decade, India should become the world's third largest economy. And in that process, there are these nine key themes which are expected to get most attention as public policies. So one of them is agriculture, increasing the productivity and resilience. There's energy security, urban development, uh, employment and skilling, of course. And this budget has been very heavy on the employment and skilling part. Infrastructure remains an important part, uh, resource, human resource development, and we will... Uh, perhaps take a close look at all these priorities as we go ahead. But on this now, also, I think it's important to end with the uh, understanding, a little bit of understanding on the taxes. The reason why I flagged this is there was an expectation before the budget that taxes will be cut. And this actually goes back to the first budget of the Modi 1.0. That budget had actually cut income taxes given more scope for standard deduction. So I don't know how that was interpreted at that time, but perhaps there was this impression this time that there might be some feel-good factor which the government might want to inject into the economy by giving some greater flexibility on taxes. Uh, one of the expectations was that cutting taxes will increase consumption. And particularly if more leverage is given on so far as taxes are concerned to the higher income categories that will increase private consumption in the category. Now, that hasn't exactly been the case, but what has happened is that, interestingly enough, India now has two tax regimes for the income taxpayers. One is an old tax regime and the other is the new tax regime. I mean, the simplest difference between the two is that the new tax regime uh, practically taxes everything at a bottom line threshold rate. But for this new tax regime, there is a standard deduction from the taxable income whose limit has been increased. So this could be taken as a signal on part of the government to indicate that more people are encouraged to move into the new tax regime. Mm -hmm. uh, some good news for the startups, the, the something called the angel tax, which has been scrapped. Not too good news for the investors because the long-term capital gains tax has been increased. And that was reflected in the response of the stock market immediately right after the budget was announced. But there are certain interesting customs duty reductions that we have seen coming in for mobile devices, critical minerals, gold, and some cancer medications and a few of those. So we are stopping here and we will 
look at each of these elements closely and the broader context of the budget as we go ahead. Sorry. Thank you, Dr. Paul. We will now commence with the panel discussion. The speakers on stage will be Mr. Khanna, Associate Editor, The Straits Times, Singapore. Uh, Ms. Devya Murli, a Research Associate, ISAS. Joining us online via Zoom are the following speakers. Professor Bernali Bhandari, a Professor of the National Council of Applied Economic Research, India. Mr. Vinod Rai, Distinguished, distinguished Vis Visiting Research Fellow, Institute of South Asian Studies, NUS, and former Comptroller and Auditor General, Government of India. The session will be chaired by Dr. Amitain Dupalit, Senior Research Fellow and Research Lead for the Trade and Economics, ISAS. Today's session will be live streamed on ISAS Facebook page. I shall now invite Dr. Palit to commence the session, please. Thank you so much, Swadi. So we will continue from uh, where we ended with the presentation and I'll first uh, uh, request uh, Mr. Vikram to uh, Vikram Khanna to come in. Vikram's an old friend, has been associated with the Institute of South Asian Studies for a very long time. Uh, he has been one of the uh, most senior journalists from Singapore following India for a very, very long time and has active knowledge about the way Indian regulations and policies have changed over side. So, Vikram, what uh, might be a good point for you to come into this conversation is that uh, we are now, uh, we have seen 10 years of the Modi government, and this is uh, Modi 3.0. Over these 10 years, there has been a certain shaping, certain delineation of the economic policies. And by this time, looking back, there are some changes that we obviously notice with respect to the 10 years that were there before, you know, the UPA 1, UPA 2. So how do you think that the current Indian economy is positioned in so far as the direction of the policies are concerned? And how does this budget fit into that? Over to you. Please take around 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Amit. Um, you know, when Amit invited me to speak uh, at this panel, my initial reaction was that, uh, you know, uh, ISAS experts follow the economy in much more granular fashion than I do. Uh, so I prefer to be sitting in the audience. They also devote full-time attention to India, which I do not. So I think they are a better place to talk about. But then he said, okay, you can just talk about the the sort of broad overview, uh, which is goes to the question you asked me. So here I am, I, I'll do that. Um, I want to outline the sort of broad philosophy, economic philosophy of the government over the last 10 years. And I'm guided reliably on this by no less than one of the economic advisors to the prime minister, Sanjeev Sanyal, who is, whom I know well and uh, who I greatly respect, uh, but I don't always agree with. Um, and he gave a talk recently to the Cambridge Union, and he he described the sort of the overall thrust of the government's thinking on on the economy. And he basically said started with saying that we are, I quote, unapologetic supply siders, that we want to um, keep increasing the productive capacity of the economy and let the magic of compounding do its work. And compounding has worked well for India from, to go from 1 trillion GDP to 2 trillion took seven years, and then it took less and less time for each additional trillion. And going from 4 trillion to 5 trillion, they say it's going to take just two years. So that's very interesting. The, the economy has grown very well, as Amit also showed us, bounce back very well after COVID, etc. Now, inequality is not high on the agenda of this government and never has been. Um, I mean, Sanyal dismissed concerns about the billionaire Raj, which has been written about by people like James Crabtree, as well as highlighted in 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 the in the World Inequality Lab work of Piketty and and Piketty and Co. Recently, actually, and uh, India has the third largest number of billionaires in the world, and. He said, and I quote, he said, if India has one-sixth of the world's population, it should have one-sixth of the world's billionaires. 
that's okay. Um, now, that is fine if you have one sixth of the world's GDP, and if you have, if you have, you're in the upper one sixth quartile of per capita income, then it's fine to have one sixth of the world's billionaires. But if you have one twenty fifth of the world's GDP, and your ranking in per capita income is 137th, and you have one sixth of the world's billionaires, there is a problem. I think there's a problem. The problem is, I think that most of the people are not doing very well. And this is reflected in the sort of the lopsided consumption that's happening. If you talk to corporate executives in India, they will tell you that their premium products are flying off the shelves, but basic products are not. It's interesting that uh, people are buying more SUVs than sedans in India, even at, so even in the auto industry. The numbers on inequality are pretty pretty extreme. Uh, the Piketty, the World Inequality Labs, found that 1% of, of Indians control 40% of wealth, that the top 10% control 65% of wealth. So what's pretty clear is that these growth numbers are wonderful, but it's, growth is not enough. Um, what is growing and who is benefiting is also important. And it seems that trickle down doesn't really work in India or has not worked in India. Um, now, Piketty, I won't go into the details, but Piketty and co. suggest various taxes, a wealth tax of 2% on incomes or uh, incomes of more than 10 crores, as well as inheritance taxes, which they say will lead to a 2.7% of GDP uh, intake uh, in, in terms of revenue, which can be used for social programs. Now, this will certainly, if this happens, uh, it, it's a very contentious issue, but if this happens, it would it would improve trickle down. But in addition to trickle down, I think what India really needs is what Jagdish Bhagwati, the economist, described as pull up. Pull up, uh, and that that involves job creation. And that brings us to really what's in the budget. Now, we know the unemployment numbers from CMIE, at least, are, are pretty bad. It's 9.2% unemployment in June, 18.5% for women, and a shocking 45% for youth, which is among the highest in the world. Um, so you must have read these stories. We ran stories, for example, in just this month, 25,000 people showed up at Mumbai airport to apply for 2,200 jobs in Air India. We've had like 100, 100 applicants for every single job in several public services. There are lots of vacancies in public services, by the way. So what's clear is that all this high growth that India has had is not creating mass jobs. And so I think, OK, the Iqbal mentioned the elections. And I think uh, one of the two of the things that came out in the elections or two of the grievances of people in all pre-election surveys was Beiros Gari and Beiros Gari meaning unemployment. And what they said was Mengai. Mengai, now that's not really the inflation rate. That's not what they're talking about. Inflation is actually quite quite okay. I think as one of your slides showed, it's like four or five percent. What they're talking about really is that they are not able to afford the essential items on their incomes. That's what the problem is. So I think wonderfully and perhaps belatedly, but rightfully, uh, the uh, government has put employment front and center in this budget uh, through the employment-linked incentives. Uh, the Congress party has complained that they stole they stole this platform from the Congress manifesto. I mean, I think that's all right. I mean, good ideas in economic policy do not have to be original. I think that that part is fine. Um, so they have, I mean, I won't go into the details. Uh, they, they're basically two lakh crores uh, for employment and skilling through five schemes, lots of subsidies. There's a free, a one month free wage for new entrants. There's uh, another set of subsidies for um, for internships. There's uh, another set for employment. Oh, sorry, uh, was it 
uh, provident fund contributions and so on. So there's all these all these things. It's very good, I think, that both skilling and employment are being tackled concurrently. I think that makes great sense. But I think the challenge is this, uh, sustaining expansion and employment after the sunset of the subsidies, after the subsidies expire. How are you going to keep expanding employment? And I think the key to that really is you have to expand sales. Demand has to go up. Demand for whatever companies are producing has to go up. Consumption has to go up. And consumption, as we've seen, private consumption is running at about 4% as compared to growth running at about 7%. So I mean, there's a big gap. I, I mentioned the lopsided nature of consumption, but that has to change. Uh, so the question arises, so what has this budget done for consumption? There are a few things. Um, one is, uh, I think Amit mentioned the tax relief for the middle class, um, if, if they have opt for the, the, second, the second tax system. I think the finance minister mentioned they, they, they get about 17,500 rupees per taxpayer on average, which is, which is, which is pretty good. Um, there will be some demand from the temporary wage support provided by the government in these employment schemes. Um, there is support for agriculture, the 1.5 lakh crores support for agriculture. And there's a generous generous allocation to Manrega, which is 40% up, which is done in the interim budget in February, is 40%, about 40% up on the previous year. So these these are all positive for demand. I think it's agriculture is particularly important. I think it has 45% of the workforce. Um, and the government tried to do farm reforms uh, a couple of years ago, or during COVID, I think. But I think we're forced to forced to rescind those reforms. Uh, so we're still we're back to the Monday based MSP focused and multiple what's that, minimum support price focused policies, which now covers twenty three commodities. I think a lot of experts say that this is problematic. The MSP is not necessarily pro pharma. In fact, Ashok Gulati, an agricultural economist, says it is anti pharma because Basically, you you create a glut in production, uh, especially at a time of bountiful harvests, and then uh, it it violates the law of supply and demand, and then demand crashes, the prices crash in the market, and the farmer is left with all this excess produce. What does he do with it? And he also points out that the items that do not have MSP, such as poultry, fisheries, uh, milk, uh, are doing much better, are growing much better than than the items that do have MSP. So he said, rather than have this sort of system, it's better to, to just give more to farmers directly uh, through the PM Kisan scheme. People were expecting that it would go up from 6,000 a month to 10,000 or so, but that did not happen in this budget. And so it's you need to do other things. You do not slap export bans to protect uh, uh, urban consumers. You should use the buffer stocks uh, if prices spike. Um, you should push harder on food processing. Only about 10% of India's food is processed compared to 30% in Thailand and 75% in Brazil. I mean, we, we could do much more in that area. And it's very interesting that Anand Nageswaran, the chief economic advisor in the economic survey said, there needs to be a national conversation on agricultural policies, including changing policy reorientation, I mean, in, in agriculture. Let me briefly talk about manufacturing. This has been driven by PLI, the product. Can I come back to manufacturing in a second? As we, or if you just want to make a very quick couple of quick points. Maybe. Okay, yeah. very quickly, um, just on manufacturing. So it's driven by PLI, the production linked incentives. But a lot of these are in very capital intensive industries, electronics, semiconductors, advanced chemistry cells, batteries, autos, pharmaceuticals, and so on. It, the labor intensive industries are not really supported by PLI. I mean, I, I was hoping that there would be some of this for things like leather, uh, footwear, and so on, but no. The finance minister did mention labor intensive industry support, but didn't say how. So that's it. Um, final point on manufacturing, I think 
India really needs to, it, this happens in supply chains, even for the most simple products like a bicycle, this product, the components come from multiple countries. If you want to really join the manufacturing export game, you have to be part of the supply chains. And that, I think, makes the case for India to join RCEP. I think you cannot really at least join the Asian supply chain without being a member of RCEP. And that's, I think the exports have to be pushed through this. As uh, Ajay Chibur and Salman Sol said, this is my last point, there's not a single country that has sustained 7% growth for a long period without a push on exports. So I'll stop there. I mean, I'll, I'll go into revenue later, but that's it. Uh, yeah. thank, thank you so much, uh, Vikram. Actually, uh, sorry for cutting you short. You know, no, no, I, I, I just wanted to labor a little bit on uh, the key points that you mentioned in the beginning, and that's essentially employment and skills, which are very uh, firmly the focus of this year's budget, whether it is because of a political realization or a serious realization of the structural constraints of the economy. But on that, I wanted to bring in uh, Dr. Bornali Bhandari from the National Council for Applied Economic Research. Uh, Bornali, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you so much, Bornali. So uh, firstly, thank you very much for making time to join us. We are uh, delighted to host you uh, for this discussion. And you have obviously uh, got a sense of uh, the conversation that we are having out here. But I just wanted to bring you into this conversation, Bonali, on the basis of the fact that, as uh, Vikram mentioned, uh, there are some uh, really substantive schemes that have been announced in the budget for generating more employment, as uh, Vikram alluded to, incentivizing more employment by the government funds being allotted to payment of one month's salaries for the new hires in the formal sector, then also picking up the provident fund liabilities for a period of two years. And finally, uh, what you have really been looking at very closely, the issue of skills, including the internship uh, programs. So would you please take us through this particular range of policies? Uh, 10 minutes for you, Bonelli, for the first round. We'll come back to you again. Sure, sure. Thank, thank you so much for inviting me to this panel discussion. Uh, I think the point on employment, I just wanted to uh, say that, um, I mean, I would like to say employment and skilling is unless and until the sectors are growing themselves, um, some sectors are growing, but not on a sustainable basis. And our CAPEX, our capital expenditure of firms is still not, uh, still not firm yet, private capital expenditure. Given that, is it, uh, you know, despite all the well-intentioned schemes, we need to stop and ask ourselves, is that, that do you really expect employment to grow? I mean, and that's the question that we need to think. My second point that, I'm sorry, I have a bad cold, so if I'm sniffling, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but uh, essentially that's the first point is, you know, is the economy growing, well, various sectors of the economy growing in a sustainable manner? That's the first thing. The second thing is that, what we find is uh, there's a basic macro disequilibrium between the Indian labor markets and Indian sectors. I think uh, Mr. Khanna has already mentioned about agriculture, that agriculture contributes about 16.5% of GDP, but it employs about 45.6% of the labor force. Industry, it's about 25% of GDP and 25% of labor force. And services sector contributes about 49% of GDP but it employs about 30% of the labor force. So there is a basic disconnect uh, here. And this disconnect is coming, why is it coming? Because our um, we are not creating enough jobs and we are not creating enough jobs. I mean, whatever jobs you are creating that is very biased towards very high skill jobs in employment generation. So if you think about uh, telecom, if you think about electronics, they require very high skill jobs whereas our majority of the labor force is pretty uh, is on the on the lower skill side so that's one so there is a again uh, there's a basic mismatch and even our and um, and it's not just about demand it's also about the supply right because the youth themselves um and they're getting degrees but they're not getting a job because they're perceived as unemployable the question is why 
why are they perceived as unemployable? They are perceived as unemployable because they're, they're getting their, uh, the quality of education in India is so low that they're not imbibing the skills that the market wants. So even if I do get a degree, I'm not able to get a job. Um, and so it's it's a both a supply and a demand side problem. So skills, em, uh, employment is in, in a, is a labor force will or demand for employment will only go up uh, if we are uh, if the sectors see an increase. Essentially, we are um, as uh, as we know from the data that we are uh, losing our competitiveness and our traditional strengths like textiles, which is a labor intensive industry. So if our, our, we are losing our competitiveness to Vietnam and Bangladesh, why do we expect that um, that they will actually hire more workers? Um, so I think these are these basic disequilibrium at multiple levels. We, uh, we need to think about that as we go ahead. And um, so when we think about these employment schemes, employment schemes for the first month, encouraging people to uh, encouraging people to hire uh, them for the first month, especially in manufacturing sector. Uh, may, uh, in my conversations with the industry, they are very, very interested. But again, they say they, they don't find the right set of people. And again, the problem is both sides. Youths don't find the jobs aspirational and uh, the industry does not find the right set of people. So there is, the, again, there's a disconnect between what the industry wants and what is being supplied to the industry. And is, is yes, internships and apprenticeships can actually solve the problem, could, could so potentially solve the problem. Uh, but again, internships are also about exposure. It's not just about employable skills, is your learning ex uh, exposure. So when you talk to the industrialists, and then the, this is my major point, when you talk to the industrialists, the, it's not just vocational skills that they are talking about. Yes, they need vocational skills, but also that, along with that, they need people with good cognitive and social emotional skills. They're willing to train if you can get good quality uh, good basic quality kids and that again speaks to the that we, when you say big what do you mean by good quality kids you basically mean is that our foundational skills of cognitive and social emotional has to be strong which is derived from school which is not derived from uh, short-term skilling programs or itis ITIs teach you the vocational skilling or if you are missing the point again and again um, about this is is then should we teach those skills in itis so these are these are the conundrums that we face as as we go forward. So yes, there is a program of giving money. We, the government is saying that we will support you um, over the years if you employ the people. But you know, if your cap, my thing is, if your capex is not going up, you're not investing. Why would you hire more people? And, and, and I stop here to answer your basic question. Um, uh, and when you bring in the MSMEs. Um, at least in my conversations with the MSMEs, they repeatedly what we hear is that, okay, fine, we train them, but they have a retention problem because we, then they leave after two, three years and they are not able to pay them higher wages. And um, again, you know, as basic as um, uh, what we call is uh, PCBs, the printed circuit boards, which is the basis of all electronic manufacturing um, or telecom manufacturing, PCBs go into everything how many people are there who are actually trained, how many institutes are there which are training um, PC, uh, people in designing PCBs or you know, operating on them. So we, are, we, we, we have a lot of ambition and aspiration, but we are not able to um, solve our disequilibrium between what we want to do and between our labor markets and then the signaling the, or the um, signaling that the labor markets are giving to the kids. And it becomes, it's a, it's a, we are stuck in a perpetual a vicious cycle. Um, so I'm, I'm a little um, hesitant about the schemes. We have seen some of these schemes before, like the, 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 the upgradation of ITIs is a fantastic idea. For, but we have seen this before in something called model ITI scheme, the hub and spoke model, where they would uh, you know, build a nice ITI and the other ITIs in the region would copy them. And uh, the question to ask is, has this been successful? Yeah, the ones which get adopted by an industry partner, yes, but not all. You know, some people have been very successful, like the auto industry has been very successful in uh, using the ITIs. But um, 
what about other sectors? Uh, what about other areas? And I stop here. I don't. Uh, I stop here uh, and say hey, the schemes are good, but we forget to ask is what is happening to the dynamism of the industry, the demand. Um, and the second thing is what is happening? What what skills are you talking about? Is just skilling on vocational skilling enough? Or do you actually need other skills? And the, from the conversations with the industry, it's not. If you see NASCOM, um, you know, they're going about AI. Uh, they've been talking about AI, the artificial intelligence. We want to hire people with artificial intelligence. But then they say, no, 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 wait. We also want people who can actually communicate. So it's not enough to just know your technical skills. You have to actually also sell that idea to the person opposite you. But to, to talk in that language, from the code language to actually the business language and there are not enough people out there. So on that note, we stop here. I stop here. Uh, Bonnelly, that's uh, actually fascinating. Thank you so much uh, for these insights because I think uh, it's, uh, it's clearly a reflection of the layers in which the complexities lie. And I think what we are seeing in this budget is a, uh, is a kind of a dedicated supply side response that uh, you know the public policy is aligned to achieve certain objectives. But from what you said very clearly, uh, it's not just the incentive that matters. It's very important for the private sector and the industry. And here, this is all for the private sector. I mean, we are not talking about government employment here. It's all for the private sector, private industry. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, taking a cue from what you mentioned, uh, we might run into a chicken and egg kind of a situation. The challenge is that whether do you train people first and expect them to be hired later? You know, as you said, because there are skills and internship programs and the industry is not getting the kind of skills that you want. So for the industry, the question is, do they wait for these people to get trained first and then hire them? Or do they start hiring for making use of the incentives that have been announced and then expect to get the skills upgraded. So I think there are many gray areas, but we will come back to this. We will come back to this and have a more detailed uh, conversation on that in our discussion. In the meantime, uh, let me uh, go over to uh, somebody who probably knows the budget making better than all of us here in the room, definitely, who has been involved with multiple budgets, uh, Mr. Vinod Rai. Sir, uh, welcome and thank you for making time uh, for being with us here today. Uh, what I wanted to check with you is a different perspective of this budget. And this is where I'm trying to bring in, uh, you know, uh, uh, what, what we call the multiple variety of stakeholders in the budget. We saw a somewhat tepid response from the stock market uh, once the budget was announced. And then we also saw that there were uh, responses which were not very robust, but nonetheless not very cynical as well, in terms of there being some amount of confusion over the greater emphasis of the budget. We have seen a continuity of emphasis on infrastructure, social sector, and as we just heard from the previous speakers, there has been this uh, very strong emphasis on employment, job creation, skills, agricultural resilience. So, sir. Uh, from your perspective, uh, how would you analyze the policies uh, broadly in the context of the budget, at least as far as the financial markets are concerned, and also the emphasis on infrastructure is concerned? Over to you. Thank you, Amit Hindu. Thank you for having me <clears throat> in the dis discussion today. Though I'm far away from uh, ISAS just now physically, but you can see I have ISAS behind me right away. Uh, so... <clears throat> Uh, it, it's it's lovely to be part of the discussion. Uh, you know, the most uh, difficult part of uh, the finance minister presenting a budget is, and that to a truncated budget, when you are presenting a budget to only part of the year, I mean, uh, uh, interim budget had been presented earlier, is that the expectations are running very high. And expectations are running very high because, uh, well, it's a government which is kind of coming into power for the third time. And then even with it, with whatever majority that it comes, there the expectations are that, well, it will deliver and it will deliver to everyone's satisfaction. Now, then the finance minister's capacity to deliver a budget, which even gives you a five-year trend or a roadmap 
it also gets truncated. But as you rightly observe, uh, the stock markets have taken the budget with uh, a kind of a pinch of salt. There was some decline in the indicators, but then it picked up. Because how has the stock market in India behaved? I mean, if you look at it from the last year, about 25, 30 years, it was, uh, uh, let me take an indicative uh, indication, uh, indices, the Sensex, which was roughly at about 3,000, I should think, in the year uh, 1995, came to 10,000 in 2008, came to about 20,000 in 2012. I mean, look at the gaps. Exceeded about 30,000 in 2017. And then it has just kind of taken off. It has just galloped. It came to 40,000 in 2019, just, you know, in two years' time. And today it stands at about 80,000 plus. Now, obviously, there is a certain element of fraud, I, I, I would say, uh, in, in, in this entire valuations. There are external people who believe that uh, the, the Indian scripts are overvalued. And because as it stands today, the value of Indian equities today is roughly about $3.5 uh, $3 trillion. And this is bigger than the two biggest stock markets in, say, UK and France. Now, but at the same time, I don't think there is any cause for worry. One, reaction of the stock market and uh, for any external observer, because Basically, I think the fundamentals of the economy are sound. Vikram had a very good point to make in the sense of distribution of the wealth or distribution of income. Uh, I mean, Banali has addressed it, but at the same time, the fundamentals are strong because even, say, um, agencies like the IMF have revised their uh, <clears throat> targets and said that, yes, uh, government is, I mean, you know, the, the, the economy is growing at a fairly rapid rate. Uh, there's a burgeoning middle class. Uh, just to give you two examples, I'm, because I talked to middle class, uh, Indigo Airlines placing an order for 50,000 aircraft is the biggest aircraft order anywhere in the world. Uh, Apple, phones, I mean, Apple setting up a, a manufacturing facility, assembling facility, uh, opening a shop. But anyway, if we had to look into the basics, what are the fundamentals? Number one, the growth prospects. Even external agencies like, say, IMF has said, if they have revised our growth from 6.8% to 7%, uh, S&P has revised it to 6.8%. Moody's has also revised it from 6.1% to 6.8%. And of course, our very own RBI has similar kind of business. Why? Because the market is returning strong earnings. The stock market has shown sound fundamentals. And it is forecasting earnings to be growing at about 17.8% into 20.25, which is the fastest uh, in anywhere in Asia. And the Agencies, the institutions are banks, healthcare, energy, all which contribute. Then, of course, real estate, uh, retailers, autos, etc. But I think the fundamental point is, and I talked about the burgeoning middle class, the burgeoning middle class is now moving away from investing in its uh, earnings or its wealth into what was earlier real estate, or probably gold and things like that. And they are moving into financial assets. I mean, institutional, domestic institutional uh, agencies such as mutual funds and things have been able to uh, take good care of these um, investments. And that's why, uh, though foreign investors tend to be active in large caps, it's the local investors that are dominating the small and middle cap space, which partly explains the outperformance. Now, we, the market always expects the rate cuts. The rate cuts may come, may not come, but the RBI paused it for the time being. That would be one of the reasons. The other is there has been a policy continuity, but I think the basic reason why the markets, 
behave the way they behave was that government also realizes that there is a certain element of froth in the market. They have introduced securities transaction tax on derivatives, which indicates some caution. There has been a capital gains tax. Equity has been hiked from 10% to 12.5%. The indexation has been removed. The basic thing is the idea is to signal an element of caution. And that's what the market was not hoping would happen. So the, base, the thing is, the government is indicating by the widening gap between the short-term capital gains and the long-term capital gains, the incentive for longer-term holdings. And this move is also a step, it seems to be, in standardizing uh, taxation across various asset classes, potentially simplifying their investment decision-making process for many of them. So I sincerely feel that, well, the market reacted the way it reacted, but basically the fundamentals are strong and hopefully with some employment generation activities and others, the government is sincere in its attempt to correct the issue regarding income uh, redistribution. And I, I come, in, come to it for, for the infrastructure aspect that you mentioned, Avitendu, because government over the last four or five years has been investing a substantial amount on invest, physical invest, infrastructure. But of course, Government investment is not enough. The requirement is so huge that we need to incentivize private investment to come in also. And this year, government has set apart 11 trillion rupees for investing in various infrastructure activities. And the good part of it is that uh, the in, increase, uh, I mean, the highest priority given is to for uh, <clears throat> issues like uh, SME, oh, sorry, uh, is rural and flood management projects to encourage states to provide some for infrastructure provision for long-term interest-free loan and to promote private sector investment in infrastructure with the viability gap funding to work out a market-based financing network. Now, there has been large sums of money which uh, have gone into Andhra Pradesh and Bihar also but these are in the areas of rural flood management and designed to provide purchasing power in the hands of the rural poor. And we are hoping that <clears throat> with these things, they are with some of these moves, the government will be able to kickstart the process of providing employment opportunities in the rural areas to build some rural infrastructure. I'll stop here for, for future. Uh, discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for those uh, thoughts, because I think you touched upon a very important point on which uh, we would like to come back and engage you further during the discussion. And that is essentially uh, this question that the government continues to remain the most active investor in the economy, uh, public investment and particularly investment in infrastructure is what is driving the economy, has been driving the economy since at least the COVID-19 pandemic broke out. Uh, the question is whether that investment is really robust, effective, and qualitative enough to encourage the private sector to continue investing and perhaps enable the government to step back, devote its funds somewhere else, and enable the fulfillment of this socially inclusive agenda that the government has spanned out. We will come and talk a little bit more about that. Before that, uh, I wanted to turn to my colleague Divya. Uh, this is essentially a part which uh, was, is, is quite of, uh, kind of unique to the discussions that we have. And we are perfectly aware of the fact that we are in Singapore and Singapore has a great degree of interest in India's economy and the business, the way it pans out. Uh, I'm Kind of proud enough to note that we are the first uh, agency in Singapore having this discussion on the India budget this time. So we have been the first out in the block and there are many more to come, I know. I mean, we have already scheduled some of us are uh, slotted to speak in this uh, discussions, but we'll try to preempt a little bit of those by asking Divya to focus a little bit on the policies in the budget, which you think are of interest to the Singapore businesses and companies. So Divya, if you just quickly take us through those. Thank you, Dr. Palat. Um, 
delighted to be a part of this panel, sharing stage with such luminaries here. Uh, just to start off on a quick comment, uh, you just finished and Mr. Rai also mentioned on the CAPEX part. So since we're talking about investments and what the businesses can expect, uh, so this time the CAPEX is at 3.4% of the GDP. It is steady. It is not as high as a spike as the last year where it was 37% increase prior compared to the previous fiscal. So the intent, and also we saw that in the beginning, the first presentation that Dr. Palit made that the government has clear emphasis and focus on infrastructure and building it up to guide the country towards the path of uh, Vixit Bharat. So what does the private sector have? What the businesses can look forward to in this is that I'll start off with the taxes first because I'm just doing the reverse order of what the finance minister is presenting. For the businesses, um, what is of interest is we mentioned in the beginning, angel tax is abolished. So startup ecosystem is pretty robust in India. Uh, we are producing a lot more unicorns than many other places in the world. So abolishing of this angel tax is a very welcome move. And it's also, the sentiment is also reflected. The second part in taxes that the corporate tax on foreign companies has been reduced from 40 to 35 percentage. There's still a substantial amount, but this is a step-by-step -step reduction here. Now, in terms of actual policies, um, what is pretty unique? We'll just say that to start off with, there is there was this mention that the finance minister made on critical minerals. So we saw that uh, about 25 critical minerals have been exempt from the customs duties. And she also mentioned about a critical minerals mission. Uh, what the mission basically tries to do is to amp up or incentivize domestic production and to see how we can recycle and do offshore mining and also to acquire uh, overseas mineral uh, facilities. The mandate for that, what can be expected, is that it will include technology development. It will have skilled workforce as the focus, and it will also have um, a producer's responsibility framework uh, and as such. So more details on these are as such. We are awaiting details, but this is something I think we can, uh, the businesses can look forward to because we all know that uh, critical minerals is a, has become a talking point ever since COVID has, uh, uh, ever, ever since the COVID began. Um, also in the, to read it in parallel to what the economic survey says, they said that they acknowledge the role that China has in the critical minerals production and the need for us to sort of get into the supply chain and the value chain of that. So this gains uh, sort of importance in that aspect. Mm, the second aspect that I would like to sort of draw attention to is on the agri agriculture path. Um, so there are two interesting announcements that the uh, businesses here might be interested in. So the government is incentivizing some shrimp production and exports. So Mr. Kanna spoke about food security. Um, I remember in 2022, Dr. Palit and I wrote a paper on uh, palm oil exports and Ever since the COVID began, we've actually seen countries sort of trying to secure their own food security needs first. So they've been stoppage of uh, exports and then opening it up. So it's been going on and off. So in this in this regard, so incentivizing shrimp production and exports is uh, the move that could be of um, interest here. Why so? Because India is the world's second largest uh, exporter of shrimp after Equator. Um, if you look at the region here, the next biggest exporter is Vietnam. Um, and for the Asia's, Asia Pacific markets here, Vietnam and Thailand are the major uh, suppliers. Um, um, so, but the difference here by, where uh, India can have a comparative advantage is that the supply gap between the between Equida's production to India's and to the Vietnam is pretty huge. So. Equida sort of uh, India, India sort of uh, in Q1 2024 exported about uh, thousand mil thousand million dollar worth of shrimp, but Vietnam supply uh, uh, 
the Vietnam's number equivalent numbers were about 700 odd. So there is a business opportunity here for India and uh, considering markets here, Singapore and Malaysia, we do see Indian shrimps here. Uh, so, and we also know that Singapore is also looking to expand its food basket and uh, the source of its uh, uh, food, um, source food countries. So this is an opportunity. The second one is the Atmanirbhata for oil seeds. Um, so Atmanirbhata also takes on the concept of besides self-reliant producing in India for the rest of the world. Uh, given the Ukraine war, uh, as soon as the war set in, the first sort of commodity price that was hit among many was the sunflower oil uh, commodity price. So there is a need to stabilize all these and to diversify the basket for everybody. So this is, again, a business opportunity. Um, besides these, uh, there is a very focused eastern side, uh, uh, a focus on the eastern states in India in this budget, uh, namely states like Bihar, Jharkhand, West Bengal, Odisha, and Andhra. We will note that uh, some of these, uh, most of these are governed by or our allies of the ruling BJP. But aside of that, what is uh, important is that they are looking to develop this corridor or these sets of states and uh, with essential infrastructure, power projects and railways, roads. These are all plans made for the, for, for the look, can't say look is policy, but the Eastern states mentioned here. Um, so there is this, um, Amritsar Kolkata Industrial Corridor Development, which has an industrial node proposed at Gaya, which is in Bihar. Um, there's also Vishakapatnam Industrial Corridor, um, and also there is a Hyderabad Bengaluru Industrial Corridor, uh, which pa on which Andhra gets some moves. So basically, these industrial corridors are areas where um, um, you you see these manufacturing cities are being built. Um, this is part of the National Industrial Corridor Development Program. Um, so it's a it's ambitious infrastructure development program uh, aimed for new industrial cities. So these are all some of the interest areas that we can look forward to. On Divya, let's take a break here at this stage, and we will come back to some of these policies because I sure. just wanted to bring in the discussion. Yes, sure. we'll come back to these policies. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the floor at this stage? If if anybody has a question to ask on the basis of what we have discussed till now, we will take that question. Otherwise, I'll try to stoke the questions. Yes, sir. And please do introduce. I mean, I of course I have seen Ronojay, but behind, sir. Yes, please yeah. introduce yourself. Uh, and... Hi, everyone. It's Vinaykin. Um, I'm a you know working professional, just interested in India, ISAS, and everything that concerns India. Right. Um, you know, quite quite a bit of talk or think tanks have spoken about the capex that's gone on in india since this government has taken uh, or you know since the covid time they've really pushed the capex uh one of the reasons i think they are doing it is that when there is so much infrastructure push or supply side capacity building uh, and inflation being a very strong priority to contain uh, the government spending will actually have no impact on the inflation side. Whereas if they do revenue side expenditure, inflation is definitely going to get out of whack as it has happened for many of the developed countries during COVID period. So I would like to know from the panel that is the government focusing on CapEx so heavily for a combination of reason, or is it just that they just want to build, build, build? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Ronajay, why don't you... Uh... Put forward your question as well. Maybe we can take three questions at one quick. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question uh, perhaps for uh, Mr. Rai. Uh, so uh, Iqbal began you know, introduced the session by talking about the political nature of the uh, budget more so because it you know, comes in the wake of the elections and tries to address perhaps some of the issues that might have led to the result. But you know, one of the sort of distinctive feature of this budget is the you know, allocation made to uh, you know, Andhra Pradesh and Bihar for obvious reasons, you know, because you have, you know, the two principal allies from the state. But given your deep experience, you know, with the budget making process, would you say this is uh, quite unusual, sort of singling out, you know, two states for special benefits? And B, was what does this say, you know, going ahead about the nature of 
you know, uh, federalism or competitive federalism in India. Thank you, Ronuja. Is there a third question that anybody might want to raise at this stage uh, or do we go back? Okay. Uh, we have two questions. Uh, the first question is, of course, on the on the utility of the capex in the sense the way the government is looking at it uh, and uh, Bonali, what are your thoughts on this if i can bring you into this question of uh, this investment drive which is being visible for the last i would say 7 to 8 years heavy focus and thrust on infrastructure uh, there are there are durable economic benefits that we all know can be obtained from large scale infrastructure building but i think there are there are two issues over here the first is that uh, this sort of an investment uh, is it really quality conscious investment in the sense that are you looking at projects which are really capable of delivering benefits long term or is that just a volume based number based investment that we are looking at which is not really responding uh, to the larger needs of the economy number one Number two, Bonali, I think this is a question which many of us are worried about, and I'll put it in the of the question that has been asked. Is this also investment which is somehow crowding out private investment in India? You know, is is, is it too much for the private sector? And the private sector is actually getting overwhelmed. You know, everything is state-driven. Everything is government. So is there a worry on part of the private sector over there? So I would love to have your thoughts on that. And then, uh, Mr. Rai, if you could... You, you would have probably heard Ronald Joy's question on the political content of the budget in terms of the especially separate allocations that have been made for Andhra and Bihar. So I'll come back to you on that. Yes, Bonali, if you'd like to go first. Um, I think it's a very interesting question. Essentially, uh, yes, we have had uh, capital, government capital expenditure go up. And as you know, that we have a huge infrastructure deficit in the country. So there is uh, the money is uh, being utilized for both volume um, and I would say also quality, because some of the Delhi Mumbai industrial corridor roads are fantastic. Um, and also because the larger objective for the government is to bring down its logistics costs. So some of, my, some of my colleagues are working on that, essentially to estimate that. And logistics costs can be brought down by uh, better connectivity. So this is something that we are looking at, uh, the government is looking at both quality and volume. I don't think it's one or the other, both quality and volume. And there has been um, uh, some tremendous uh, improvement in our infrastructure. I also would, would like, like to add is that uh, here the government is also doing very interesting things, especially in roads, which is one of our mature sectors, is that uh, they have done introduced something called infrastructure investment trusts. Essentially, the roads which are already um, you know up and operationalized and up and running, they're monetizing that using in invits and bonds and using that money to the, then reinvest it back into other infrastructure sectors. So there is uh, that that is a very interesting thing that is happening in Indian in, in infrastructure sector. The the point that I would like to I mean this is something I was thinking when I was uh, when uh, the question was being talked about. I would also like to relate to the skilling that you know it's it's not the new sector old sectors where we have now de developed expertise. But the thing is how to develop expertise in new sectors like data centers, you know, how to have PPPs, how to develop that, and how to the, then, you know, and that's where the skilling requirements are, that how do you, um, how do you generate capacity in that? And that's, it's, the project financing is a very specific skill, and there's a very rare skill in India, and there is a skilling gap there also. Whether is it, it is crowding out private investment? Um, I think to a certain extent, yes, uh, yes. I, I mean, yes and no, because I think the government has adopted a more champion, industry champion type of model where, where you know, the difficult sectors where they are not able to invest, they're bringing in champions who will invest in these uh, sectors. I think that is a, a very interesting way of uh, uh, bringing in private investment. Um, but as a result of bringing in industrial champions, uh, the question is, what are you doing to your medium and small and medium firms? And that's, uh, you know, and again, most of our employment is generated there. So in, in one way, yes, it's trying to solve the problem, but there are macro linkages to other parts, which uh, creates a disequilibrium. Uh, 
and there are no easy answers. Let's not pretend there are any easy answers here. Um, so, and uh, climate change is very real. You know, despite all the deluge of pictures that we see, um, the climate change is real when you get a lot of rainfall in one uh, few hours, uh, the infrastructure is not able to cope up. So again, we need to think through the long term and uh, how to uh, create infrastructure which can actually be uh, less susceptible to you know uh, these uh, climate disasters or climate change issues as we go forward. Um, right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monadi. Uh, Mr. Ray, before I come to you, Vikram, you wanted to add something quickly to the infrastructure question. Uh, yes, on the just a couple of points. One is that, of course, it creates multiplier effects uh, on the economy. The other on the crowding out issue. I mean, one of the problems about the private sector not being sufficiently involved is, is financing. I mean, long term financing. And here, I mean, I wish the government had apart from raising capital gains taxes, on the other side, could have made more, given more favorable treatment to debt funds to incentivize bond issuances so the private sector can raise long-term funding. Otherwise, they have to depend on the banks, which is not really not the appropriate way, uh, because it's basically retail banks. It, it's not the appropriate way to raise infrastructural funding. Another one, another issue is uh, quality. You mentioned quality, and we've had many instances of bridges collapsing, roads being flooded because there's no proper drainage, airport roofs collapsing, and so on. It's become quite, uh, you know, quite a serious problem. And I think somebody, I can't remember who, has suggested we need a separate agency to to monitor the the quality and the maintenance of infrastructure. Uh, it needs a dedicated agency to do, to do that. So yeah, so yeah. just just that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Vikram. Dr. Palit, can I come in a little? Just a very quick point. Uh, I do want to add is that the government is trying to develop the bond market. Um, and just because I've studied it last year with something related infrastructure financing, and the, the government is trying to develop the bond long term bond market. But again, the underlying conditions are not always favorable to India. Like you know the um, there are very strict restrictions on how much insurance and pension funds can invest in the bond market. So uh, so we have more Japanese and Canadian pension funds investing in the Indian bond market versus the Indian pension funds themselves. This is a constant perennial problem that we have heard when we were talking to stakeholders. And so uh, so the, it's trying, but there are obviously there are other issues which restrict or constrain uh, India's development in bond market uh, uh, with this thing. So then we asked the firms that why are you not doing it? And the answer was, um, again, is that uh, when you design, uh, there are still issues of designing these infrastructure projects uh, that uh, we don't spend enough time on, on designing them well. Um, and, and that results, you know, that has consequences down the road. But uh, the, so there are issues of infrastructure implementation um, in some of the things, but we have done a good job in some of these industrial Mumbai, Delhi, Mumbai industrial corridors and some of the highways. The local roads and the local uh, this thing are, of course, uh, quite challenged. I'm, I'm, I'm not pretending that they don't exist, but uh, there is a movement towards it. But of course, you know, we have to create, uh, remove all these others, uh, other challenges uh, if we want to develop the bond market in India. So it's it's a it's work in progress, but it's much better than what it was before. I just want to quickly come. I I think Bernalee, this uh, question about India developing an effective bond market. Uh, for mobilizing long-term funds from the households in India uh, continues to remain a challenge because I think uh, Mr. Rai mentioned in his early remarks that there is clearly a trend, particularly among the young Indians, uh, to put their savings more in financial instruments as opposed to precious holdings like gold and so on and so forth. But while they keep doing that, uh, the challenge is to bring out those savings into a pool where they can be utilized effectively for capital asset building. So I think we'll need to continue that conversation. It will remain an active part of it. But uh, Mr. Rai, sir, this political character of the budget, I'll just leave it over there. So if you could just enlighten a little bit on that. How can you have a 
parliamentary form of government without adding politics into it. You know, uh, the survival is politics. So Ranija, of course, has asked a question, the answer to which he knows, you know. Uh, see, the issue is, uh, well, there is a certain element of optics in it, no doubt about it. Uh, it is not a normal pra practice to indicate such large amounts state-wise. That used to be in the old time planning commission, they used to do that and they were uh, constituting plant funds. Uh, but if you will recall, uh, there was a demand from these two states to get special category state status. Now, that was not possible. Finance Commission had written it off. But they had to be, in some ways, SOH. And this was a demonstration which has been given. But I, I think there is a further political element to it. And the further political element is an indication being given to the other states which are likely to be going to polls in the current year. And Maharashtra is a very important state in it. Maharashtra requires huge amount of infrastructure development. So Maharashtra, uh, Haryana, and Jharkhand, it's some kind of allurement which is being offered. So yes, there's an element of politics in it. It's not normally done, but well, it's being resorted to. And I guess uh, this is uh, the thin edge of the wedge. Just another word about capex and why we are building, building, building. Is it only for that purpose? Now, we need to recognize one fact. That was a question that somebody had asked from the audience. See, the fact remains that uh, India is suffering from a huge problem of migration of labor from rural areas to urban areas. The urban infrastructure is not able to contain all of them. The attempt is to try and diversify industrial uh, units into areas where this migration will not take place. Now, for industry to be set up, what is required? Connectivity, accessibility, roads, railroads, maybe near to, I mean, access to ports, and of course, uh, <clears throat> water and power availability. Now, government in, is making an attempt to provide all these facilities in different areas so that industries could be set up there to, and that's where labor could be centralized or localized rather than have them move to, uh, to other established urban areas. And that's why the, uh, the, the preference or the prominence which is being given to uh, CapEx in these areas. I hope that answers the question. Uh, that, that's an interesting point, Mr. Rai, because I think there's this... Uh... There's this detail in the budget which talks about establishment of workers' facilities, primarily women workers' facilities in form of women workers' hostels in a public-private partnership mode uh, so as to enable uh, this traffic that is coming in from the rural areas to the urban areas to uh, have some enabling conditions incentivizing movement. That's something on which we should perhaps have a detailed conversation but before that, I just wanted to uh, sort of uh, catch, quote unquote, two very distinguished uh, presences uh, in this uh, group that we have out here in the today. The first is uh, an old colleague of mine from the Ministry of Finance, who also incidentally happens to be a former Chief Secretary of the State of Punjab. So Anirudh, welcome. And I can't resist the temptation of asking for your thoughts on the budget, uh, your general views, please, as well as uh, any questions that you might want to ask. And after that, sir, Mr. Girija Pandey, who has been on the ISAS board, a uh, leader of the data group and the TCS in the Asia Pacific. From you, sir, I particularly want to know a connection that uh, Iqbal raised in his first points. You know, we haven't talked about the China plus one strategy. Uh, we haven't uh, thought of the RCEP. So maybe I'll come back to you on that once Anirudh has his thoughts. Please, Anirudh, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Amit. Uh, th Mitendu, it's a pleasure to uh, reconnect with you after a very, very long time. And uh, good evening to Vinodraj, sir. Uh, I was in DA along with Amitendu when you were there, sir, in Cabinet Secretariat uh, and uh, uh, there, sir. Uh, uh, on the budget, I, you know, I mean, I, I think that it was a very difficult task for the Finance Minister. 
uh, uh, this time, uh, especially uh, given the political compulsions that the government was facing. Uh, but uh, uh, that said, and it's it's always difficult, you know, uh, balancing so many uh, factors. And if we actually all start listing out the challenges, we could run into pages, you know, starting with agriculture and employment, jobs, uh, balanced region development, infrastructure, quality, skilling, uh, you know, quality of education. Uh, uh, Professor Bernari really mentioned uh, uh, the, you know, two points, and I'm, I'm actually very impressed with the, both the points uh, that you raised. One was the issue of employability. You know, the youth that is coming out, uh, the industry finds them unemployable. That's that's something very, very real. I, I do recount uh, an industry uh, which shut down in uh, Punjab, which was actually uh, supplying uh, components to Pratt & Whitney that for the engines that go into the manufacturing of Boeing. I mean, I never knew it when I was there that that could be a kind of facility that could exist. But he had to shut down his facility precisely for the fact that he was not getting enough skilled manpower. And the point that was again mentioned was that he said that he invests on them, trains them, and when they are sufficiently trained, they then migrate to Bangalore or even find employment abroad to Germany or other places. Now, that, that was the challenge that was being faced. And the second, I think, is the quality of uh, in investment that goes into capital infrastructure. I mean, capital infrastructure is important for us. Uh, uh, capital investment that we are doing for uh, building physical infrastructure. But I think uh, what disturbs one is uh, when bridges uh, you know, fall like nine pins in Bihar. Uh, every day you see bridges collapsing in Bihar, uh, even a tunnel uh, in, in, in the heart of uh, the national capital mm -hmm. being shut down because of poor quality. Now, that's something and uh, that, that, that's a cause of worry because while we are spending a huge amount of money on uh, building infrastructure, the quality needs to be taken care of. That's something which is of a huge, uh, huge challenge for us. Uh, what I would say is that what we lack is systems. To my mind, there was also mention of uh, provisioning of o &M for uh, infrastructure throughout its lifetime. That is something that we again lack. We do not build into the entire uh, project uh, financing the o and part, part of it. So while highways are being built, uh, bridges are being built, unless it's a toll highway where you do, uh, you are generating sufficient funds for uh, repairing or maintaining them over their life cycle, uh, this becomes a challenge. But I mean, to my mind, three points for the budget, uh, three big takeaways. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I, put, I mean, put them down in the uh, piece also that I wrote uh, yesterday. Uh, one is uh, the continuous emphasis on fiscal consolidation. I'm, I'm very impressed with that that uh, the government is sticking to its path. It was very, very easy for, it was very tempting, you know, even in the interim budget, I mean, uh, full marks to uh, the government for resisting the temptation, uh, you know, to uh, open its purse strings uh, in the run-up to the elections uh, that, and sticking to the fiscal consolidation path. The states have to follow that. Uh, that's, I think, uh, a, a big challenge because ultimately uh, we are still uh, beyond that uh, danger level, I would I would say, in terms of uh, uh, our, our fiscal deficits, we need to pull ourselves back, especially uh, consolidate the fact that on the fact that we are into a regime of monetary stability with inflation really within our target range. Uh, the second point, I think, uh, to my mind is the this is this is one budget, you know, which has gone beyond numbers. Earlier, one would really uh, listen to a finance minister's speech where they would just reel out a couple of schemes, allocations, uh, increase allocations to X, Y, Z schemes, and then come down to part B, where you would uh, either slash a couple of duties or tax rates and give the big numbers and that's the end of it. But this time, I think this is because budget is also a fiscal policy statement of the government. You know, this is one budget where I see there is some kind of thought process that has been communicated by this government. Where do we look to in the medium term of five years? And where do they want to take us in the, in the next 25 years to 2047, uh, Bharat? That's something I think which is very, very encouraging. That also speaks of the uh, evolution of the entire budgetary process in the, in the country. And the third, of course, uh, and, and the final point that I want to make is the, the, uh, the focus that is now shifting to two very important points, which actually I think uh, were flagged in the previous elections, which are jobs and 
mahangai of course as uh, uh, was being said mahangai is not really about inflation it's it's about affordability and then the uh, concomitant issue of income gaps that's uh, really something a, a cause of worry so those are my thoughts on uh, the budget but thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity and it's been very very interesting to listen to this discussion thank you thank you thank you anirudh thank you for i think that was very well said thank you ah uh, mr pandey please so what was unsaid in the budget but was said in the economic survey was what they called the china conundrum and i think what is that is where the manufacturing the global value chain manufacturing and exports come into play and these three things were not talked in the budget but in the in in the economic survey they very clearly put a chart which said what is the china conundrum should we have a trade deficit and import or should we get capital from china first time actually i saw something like this which is very hard thing because this has been something for the last 4 5 years we've closed the tap from china but then we realized that actually manufacturing and global value chains can't survive without being inclusive with the chinese supply chain because the rest of the world relies on it regardless of the political drama that goes on with every part of the world and china so i think for the first time we are being practical and this is where which brings me to what uh, uh, vikram said about the rcep because you cannot have that without signing the rcep which we nearly signed till we backed off in india many years ago so i think what we need to now look at is how do we so we talked about apple coming in but apple is only one you need to get teslas you need to get all the global value chains but when you get a global value chain the first round will be simple assembly which is what is happening in apple we are doing the assembly the components 90% are coming from china slowly we will implement and start manufacturing some of those because these are high precision items these are not these are high precision items for which india will have to create the skills and the equipment to do it which will happen there is no uh, you know <clears throat> so if other companies have to come on a china plus one as you asked me strategy then we will have to open because when you bring the assembly in this the your supplier one tier one supplier tier two supplier sitting in china right so you will have to allow that to happen and we will get back to what we were doing when the chinese companies were investing in india right So I think these three issues have to go together: global value chain coming into India, which means that you will have to allow, and it's not only Chinese; the Japanese will come in, the Koreans will come in, but the China, you know, it dominates manufacturing. We whether we like it or not, that is reality. The second thing is the Chinese have now overtaken the West in the technologies in the renewable sectors. CATL is the biggest battery manufacturer in the world not only the biggest battery manufacturer their technology is the highest in the world so we need to now get this technology of renewables whether it is evs whether it is batteries whether it is solar panels whether it is from there much cheaper than what you would get anywhere else so i think we have to now very clearly decide politics versus uh, manufacturing and exports versus rcep you won't be able to do it without signing the rcep so i have a feeling the government is moving towards it to 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 signal in the in the uh, in the uh, economic survey was very heartening so uh, can i just yeah, add sure. something no, very good. very good points um, giriraj just just one thing on the china plus 1 actually china itself is doing china plus 1 china itself is investing in Vietnam is investing in Thailand is investing in Southeast Asia basically partly to to ev- evade the tariffs that are being applied on China but even because for cost reasons is cheaper uh, chinese wages have gone up so actually the china plus one means chinese investments could come into india as part of china plus one so i think that's that's also an issue there 
China plus one story is also that the trade deficit with China has been growing. It is the highest. It's 85. With, despite all controls, the trade deficit has yeah. continued to grow. So yeah. now it's better to take capital than a deficit. I'll, I'll just uh, add two very quick points on that. In fact, uh, the China plus one uh, strategy is something on which we should have a separate discussion. It's really a deserving subject to have a discussion. Maybe Iqbal and you and I can talk about this. But just two quick points, Vikram, on what you said and what Mr. Pandey said. Uh, one is that something interesting in terms of the customs duty changes in the budget. So uh, the reduction of customs duties on capital goods for manufacturing of solar cells and panels, I think is a good move in that area. Uh, this connects to Mr. Pandit two things that you mentioned. One, just going back to this admission in the economic survey. I think it's a very tacit and candid admission in terms of the practical difficulty of India decoupling from China. It's it's not acceptable in a rational sense. But the, that's also being visible on some policy fronts where there is now a softer stance as far as giving visas to Chinese technicians coming to India. And this is a view that is a demand that has actually come from industry in terms of their easier access. So I think the METI and the trade ministry are working closely with the home ministry on that. So perhaps we might see some further developments in that. We'll talk on that. I'll take, Iqbal, your permission to just go on for three, four minutes since we started. So any question from, from the floor at this stage? Anybody? Hi, come in. Thank you, uh, Dr. Palit. Uh, there's so much being uh, talked about the industry. And I thought I'll uh, pitch in with a few comments. You, you need to introduce yourself. I know who you are. <laughs> right. For the rest of it. Right. So I'm Avnish, and I head uh, the Confederation of Indian Industries office here in Singapore, especially representing Indian businesses here in Singapore. So, uh, uh, so just the, so much was being talked about uh, by the uh, on the industry rather than what industry industry should do, and on and on other things. Uh, I'm just coming back from Delhi where uh, we had our uh, national council meeting led by CI president, and I want to share a few a uh, few points from that. Is uh, one is the skilling matter uh, is is a it's a concern for the industry and it has been raised at uh, various levels uh, industry recognizes this, that that, that uh, this is an uh, this is an issue uh, but ci in its own way is sort of uh, ta uh, tackling it uh, 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 so we have an institution uh, we've just launched it's called the ci rahul bajaj institute for uh, skilling where we are looking at working closely with industry and academia on developing and building this skilling charter because it's uh, we can't leave it organic as it has been happening and and as uh, it has been it was mentioned earlier the quality of candidates that have been coming which are not being very great so this is something where industry is very keen it's a problem and it is being looked at uh, second thing is uh, on on women also uh, and this is something where uh, uh, most industrialists and particularly CI is very, very interested in. Getting women into the workforce is important. And uh, and this, uh, uh, in the budget where it was announced of the incentive towards getting women in the workplace is very, is, is looked at, it's being looked at by industry very positively. Third is on the capex and investments. When we talk about industrial investments, yes, industry is very much interested in looking at the other states. Uh, but the view is that uh, the most of the changes and the uh, uh, that are required to facilitate investments are now with the states itself, and the states have to do the necessary changes, not at the central government. So we are looking forward to that, as in. Uh, uh, as in when, as in when it happens. So uh, overall, of course, uh, uh, as industry, it's it's a positive it's a positive budget, and we'll see how these elements actually uh, go on. Thank you. Thank you, Avnish. In fact, there's one point that uh, Divya and I uh, we were thinking that we would bring to the attention of the people over here. A point that has not been discussed much, and this is a move to take India's uh, DPI, the digital, uh, you know, public, public infrastructure, infrastructure to land. In the sense that there is this uh, scheme which has been announced of digital identities to be given to parcels of land, the Bhu Aadhaar. And in a sense, it can actually create a lot of enabling 
uh, you know, conditions in the land market, because as we all know, and Anirudh would bear me out, that one of the biggest problems in India's uh, rural real estate market, if one can define it that way, is because the records to the property are not established. There's a huge problem in getting into the buyer-seller transactions. In fact, many people actually have to take the price as given. They cannot influence the price through their own capacities. So this could be a game-changing move. And along with the land registries that are being talked about by bringing in the GIS technology for urban land mapping. So we feel that this could be an important step. But again, and I'd like to, I think uh, Mr. Rai would be the first person to put out a line of caution here. Land eventually at the end of the day is a state subject in India. So it depends a lot upon how the states are able to respond and cooperate in this regard. Uh, I'm aware of the fact that some tea is awaiting us. I don't want it to get cold, but if there is any last question, anybody that wants to raise uh, from there? No? Okay. If no, then on that note, uh, do I have the authority of ending the discussion or do I need to give it back to you, Swati? Yeah. Uh, but I will need to really uh, sort of fulfill my duties by thanking everybody and particularly our very stellar panelists. Bonali, thank you so much. I know we have kept you away from lunch. Please excuse us. I hope we have the opportunity of buying you lunch someday, either in Delhi or in Singapore. Thank you so much for joining us. And Mr. Rai, we won't even talk about lunch with you, but you are there in the HMKT. So... Yes. No, you're, you're going to keep me away from tea also, the tea that you will be having. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much, Vikram. Thank you, Divya. Thank you. Thank you, distinguished speakers and the members of the audience for your participation as well. We have come, we have now come to the end of the ISAS panel discussion. We thank you for your presence and hope to see you at future ISAS events. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.